For our first panel of the afternoon, we have a discussion on international space cooperation, Artemis civil space and state partnerships. To moderate this panel, we are delighted to have Majin Ryer and Sample of NORAD Northcom, where he serves as the Chief of Balloon Intercept Law. Good afternoon, everyone. My name again is Major Ryan Sample um, with NORAD and US Northcom. Uh, this is an awesome panel we have today on international um, space cooperation. So to continue the theme of the conference, uh, it's a great way to kick off the first panel. And we have three distinguished panel um, members here. And so we have Artemis Accords, benefit sharing, um, some governmental uh, international cooperation. So it's going to be awesome. And let's make it awesome. So I invite all the audience to help me ask great questions after each one. Um, we're going to do it a little differently. So each panel member will give a unique topic, and then we'll have a chance to do a Q&A after each one. So think of some good questions. Um, today on our panel, we have Dr. PJ Blunt, my former professor. Um, he's currently at the Cadiff University School of Law and Politics. We have Dr. Rosanna DiPlano with the University of Leicester School of Law and Professor Steve Mirama um, with the NASA Office of General Counsel. So I encourage you to look at their bios and completeness in the packet, very impressive. Um, we should have a good panel today. So first, I will hand it over to Dr. Blunt for his presentation. Well, hello. Um, sorry, I feel like I look like a big supervillain up there on the screen. Um, I'm sorry that I couldn't be in Colorado with you all. I'm, I'm especially heartbroken because as soon as this panel's composition was announced, Steve uh, emailed me and was like, we're going to have so much fun in Colorado. And I, I had to say, I'm, I'm sorry, I'm not going to be there. Um, so what I want to talk a little bit about today is this idea of cooperation and within the context of the Artemis Accords, um, since Artemis is, is part of the name of the panel. Um, and I want to start with the context of the Outer Space Treaty itself, which I'm sure that you will hear a lot about during this um, the, the, the conference. Um, but what I want to point out about the Outer Space Treaty is that there are very few what we would call thou shalt nots in it, right? We've got Article 2 that bans appropriation. We've got Article 4, which is on weaponization. But other than that, there isn't a great deal of, you know, hard obligations about you shouldn't do this and you shouldn't do that. There's actually a lot, though, in it about cooperation, and it comes in two packages. The first is um, information sharing. If you break down all the articles of the Outer Space Treaty, you'll find that more deal with information sharing of some sort than anything else. And the other thing is this obligation of international cooperation. It's the single most used term in the Outer Space Treaty. I think it makes it in there seven times. So this is, I think, important, right? We, we know that international cooperation is a somewhat weak obligation, right? There is, um, we had the benefit sharing declaration, which sort of says, yes, you should cooperate, but you get to make the decisions on how you're going to do it. But at the same time, it's a central principle in outer space law. Um, and I would say it's a central principle in thinking about how we make sure that space is a secure and safe um, environment to operate in. Um, and, and I think this makes a lot of sense, right? When they were drafting the Outer Space Treaty, it's 1967. They didn't know what space exploration was going to look like. They didn't know what sort of technology was going to come along. And so sort of as a foundational, um, you know, what we might call a foundational ethic for the treaty, the idea was, hey, talk to each other, work with each other, try to deconflict yourselves and and i think that that's an important thing to think about and and i do think that that brings in good context to kind of talk about the artemis accords which i would suggest are, are a significant shift in u.s policy um I, I, if you've looked at sort of my work which i don't expect many of you mutants to have done that right um but if you did right you would you would find that I had for a long time been fairly critical of the United States and how it was going about sort of the 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 diplomacy of space. Um, you know, beginning in sort of the Clinton administration and into the Bush administration, there was this idea that we're not going to talk about new rules in space, that that's not the thing that we want to do. We don't think we need any sort of new rules in space. And I think that over the past, I would 
say five or six years, we've seen a number of indicia that's showing that there's a shift here. And I think the Artemis Accords are a great example of it because it shows that the United States is at least willing to begin to have a conversation about some sort of normative framework. And I think there are a handful of reasons for this. Um, you know, if we look all the way back to 2001 and the Rumsfeld Report, the idea of a um, of the Pearl Harbor in space sort of thing led to a recognition that we depend on this. We need this. And without cooperation, we can destabilize this environment very quickly. Um, there's also a, a, a greater push for commercial operators. And I think commercial operators are concerned about their investments. They want to have safe operations. They want to have operations um, that, that they can depend on. And they are beginning to recognize that cooperation in the sphere is really important. So is there a, a lag or something? I see Steve laughing. Um, so, um, so, so this is this is a really important thing, and I think that the the Artemis Accords are show a, 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 a major shift away from this. We don't want to talk about new rules to recognizing um, that rules are really important to the the safe and secure operations there, and and I think that it's important to recognize that the Artemis Accords are a cooperative effort, right? These aren't, um, you know, there was a big critique when they first came out that this is a unilateral action when actually. They were discussed with the original signatories. They were, I don't want to use the word negotiated because it's not a treaty, but there was a back and forth. There was a give and take um, to, to found these. Um, and, and I think that that is an important thing to recognize. I also think that it's important to recognize that anyone can sign them, right? You don't have to come to the United States and say, hey, can I sign those? No, you can sign them without without having to ask. And I think that shows sort of a, a, a bit of, of willingness to cooperate um, in this area. And I think that why these are important is they show a, a move towards norm formation or norm building, right? This idea that we do need a normative order to make sure that we have long-term operations. And I think that that's an important shift in the way that um, the, the United States has begun to look at space. It, it shows that um, the, the, this old way of thinking of, well, we don't need new rules because um, we can do what we want into, well, we need new rules because we need to be able to cooperate. And I think that's a really, really important shift. Um, now, of course, these don't, these aren't, this isn't law, right? This is not a treaty yet, but it is a push towards norms. Um, and, and honestly, if you take the, the Artemis Accords, 98% of them are completely non-controversial. Um, it the only parts that 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 any state would say is controversial are the part on resources and the part on safety zones. But even that is a push towards at least trying to solve specific problems that exist um, in in the, the the space world and and in particular safety zones. Right, the idea of deconfliction and the idea of uh, coordinating operations in space is critical to ensuring safe operations. Um, and so while at the End of the day, we might not end with that norm of safety zones. I do think that it's a really important step towards the establishment of, of proper coordinated processes that, that keep operators safe and secure in orbit and protect the assets that are up there. Now, I do think that we have to recognize the challenges that, that, that this is going to face, right? Because this is norm building at the international level. It's taking out and trying to get states to um, to to engage with them, and obviously some states have, but but there are states that we might consider to be adversary states or states that are are opposed um, to this. And I I think that there is a really interesting dynamic out there right now. Um, you know, the the U.S. is wanting to build sort of this normative order from the ground up in the sense that we're not going to jump directly into legally binding. Um, let's think about how to get ground principles. Let's think about how to build up into a governance system. Um, and we do have this sort of binary, right? Right. There is this um, the binary of China and Russia 
insisting that this should be legally binding and that we can't talk about it unless we're talking about it in a legally binding sense. And I think that one of the wonderful things about the Artemis Accords is it's beginning to show that the emperor has no clothes um, on, on China and Russia's, uh, uh, you know, um, on their stance on this, right? This idea that, you know, for a long time, it was them saying, well, we put forward the PPWT and the United States won't come and talk about it. Well, now the United States has put forward a, a proposal that is really quite non-controversial. And the the fallback position is, well, it needs to be in the deadlocks conference on disarmament. And I, and I think that uh, helps helps show that there's there is there's there's a little bit of disingenuousness uh, on the way that they're approaching things. I think the other interesting thing to note here, and I'll kind of wrap up on this, is um, one of the challenges that I've noted um, is, is this idea of the talking about responsible behavior, right? We've moved towards this, this vocabulary of responsible behavior in space. I think it's really interesting that, that China in particular opposes this language, right? The idea of talking about responsible behavior in space has become something that they are not very interested in. They don't want to talk about that. And it's been explained to me before as they see this as when, when the West's view of what responsibility is trying to be imposed on them, right? This is what we think responsibility is and China feels like that's being imposed on them. And I think that's really interesting because it, 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 it underlies sort of the challenges of coming to a shared vocabulary around space that, that all nations can get behind. Um, you know, and, and I think that we should have room to think about other words, right? Maybe legitimate, um, uh, legitimate behavior in space would, would be something that, that could become, um, you know, something that, that, that would bridge that gap. But I think it's a, a gap that needs to be bridged. And I think it's one that, that needs to be talked about. And so I guess the point of this is I think the Artemis Accords are a great step in that direction, a great change in the way that this policy has been pursued. Um, and with that, I'll, I'll leave it. And uh, I'm happy to take some questions I'll, I'll ask a question um sure how do, how do you forecast um the artemis accords and how do you think um it'll affect international cooperation in the future is it a, is it done or how is it going to progress or evolve I, that's a hard question to answer um I don't know that the Artemis Accords are going to turn into the normative framework of the future, right? I, I think there's a lot of hurdles to, to, to be jumped at that point. But I do think um, that as, the, as, as they get more signatories, as they move along and, and get more signatories, that they can have a positive role in, in impacting norm development across the, the, the arena, right? It starts a conversation. Um, and so I think that to some extent, it's going to depend on, um, you know, how long the U.S. can keep them as a, a relevant thing in the diplomatic sphere, um, how many more signatories can be brought on board that begin to say, hey, you know what, we need these types of, of principles. Um, but I think that maybe the, the 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 biggest thing that we might get out of them is just some ground principles, right? Um, a lot of the the principles there they, they flow out of the treaty regime, but I I think that that maybe one of the ways of getting through the diplomatic st stalemate is beginning to find some common ground amongst the space actors, and I think the Artemis Accords um, it could be a path towards that. And Dr. Blount, we uh, we also have uh, some additional info or additional questions coming in from our online uh, viewers as well. Okay. This one comes from Maker, Megan uh, Seifert, uh, who says, any thoughts on how the Artemis Accords can be used to determine jurisdictional questions between private actors going forward? I, ugh, I don't know. <laughs> um, I, I think that the idea of, of deconfliction is probably where that that gets to the most. But I mean, I, I think that when it comes to the idea of jurisdiction, right, that you get wrapped up in in which state has jurisdiction. And I don't know that the Artemis Accords are necessarily going to solve that particular problem. Um, however, I do think that this idea of thinking about deconfliction and thinking about safe operations helps us understand what what is acceptable behavior what is the behavior that we can that that we can count on and that might begin to influence courts and that might begin to influence the jurisdictions that commercial actors 
begin to seek uh, to resolve their, um, their their disputes in. Now, that's total speculation on my part. And one last question, Dr. Blount, um, and thank you. We, this is from an anonymous attendee uh, who asks, do you feel that the unilateral bilateral approach is more or less legitimate in any way um, than the inherently multilateral approach required under the UN COPUS? I think I think it's just another tool in the toolbox. Um, you know, I, I think that that the consensus process that we see at UN Copulus is a really valuable one. I, I'm not. I would never suggest that we should go to UN Copulus and try to go to a winner takes all majority votes type thing. At the same time, we have to recognize that a reality of of space diplomacy is that there is a lot of deadlock, um, and that deadlock is because of these these multilateral consensus approaches getting through that deadlock is important to getting actual outcomes that increase security that increase safety um, that increase sustainability and so i think that finding ways to begin to build norms outside of un copulus that can then make their way into the un copulus process is is really important um and so so I don't say I don't think that one is more legitimate than the other, um, but it, you know it's sort of a you know, I hate to use the word marketplace, but it's it's a it's it's a way to build a norm that can then be taken into you and copulus and potentially have influence there. Um, but but I do think that at some point, right, it has to move into the into copulus, and there has to be a discussion about it there. Um, but we do have to recognize that there are are, are limitations in these things. Um, there are going to be geopolitical limitations. And those geopolitical limitations don't necessarily get rid of the fact that we have a need to coordinate activities. And, and that's going to be important as well. All right. Thank you, Dr. Blount. Thank you. Now we'll turn to Dr. DiPlano for your presentation. Thank you very much. And good afternoon, everyone. Can you hear me well? It, and apologies for my Italian accent. <laughs> Um, today, I would like to share with you just some ideas on the role of international cooperation in benefit sharing, as I put here in the slide. And my normative starting point for my reflections is Article 1 of the Outer Space Treaty of 1967, which states that the exploration and use of outer space shall be carried out for the benefit and in the interest of all countries. Now, this specific provision has been variously interpreted by scholars. There is a whole range of interpretations and sometimes very different from each other, even contradictory. <laughs> but there is also one point of convergence among this variety of, of interpretations. And it's really the idea that Article 1 of the Outer Space Treaty creates an obligation for states to generate positive impacts stemming from the outer space activities, positive impacts from, for the international community as a whole. And this is what we call the principle of benefit sharing. The problem is that it's very difficult to first and foremost uh, determine what is appropriate sharing, how much you should share, and also who decides about sharing. And it is equally difficult to determine when a state is in breach of the obligation of benefit sharing, and also in the first instance, whether this is an obligation which is unforeseeable at all. And so, as you, as you may appreciate, the challenge posed by Article 1 of the Outer Space Treaty on benefit sharing, it's very difficult to circumvent. But it is a legal obligation, it's legally binding, and so it must be acted upon. And personally, I'm not very convinced that drawing an analogy with the global commons, and in particular with the law of the sea, is really a viable solution. Uh, not least because the UN Convention on the Law of the Sea of 1982 describes the oceans and the deep seabed as the common heritage of mankind, which means common property of the international community as a whole. And in doing so, in a sense, it subordinates the provisions on benefit sharing in that convention to a certain logic of distributive justice. Uh, what's wrong with that? Nothing as such, but even the latest of the technical studies of the International Seabed Authority, if you read it, it was published in 2021, March 2021. It clearly states that those provisions of the UN Convention on the Law of the Sea on Benefit Sharing, if implemented, are unlikely to say the least to produce any beneficial impact on the beneficiaries which are essentially developing countries. 
And so for all these reasons, I really like to take a very different approach to the idea of benefit sharing for outer space. And I start by asking a very simple question. Uh, is this obligation of benefit sharing an obligation of conduct or an obligation of results? Hmm. These are two classic categories of the law of state responsibility under public international law. And unfortunately, the simple reading, the textual reading of Article 1 of the Outer Space Treaty does not really provide any definitive answer to my question, because it could be interpreted as an obligation of due diligence, obligation of conduct, or an obligation of result. <laughs> So in order to supplement the basis of observation, the background knowledge to answer my own question, I have actually examined uh, the practice of states on benefit sharing as it has been manifested within COPOS, the UN Committee on the Peaceful Uses of Outer Space. And the findings of my, my research show that over time, states have developed three different understandings of what benefit sharing means for outer space. And the oldest, the first and the oldest of these understandings uh, actually states that um, all countries or states are entitled to the means for the exploration and use of outer space. Because if you have the means to explore outer space, you can benefit from your own activities as opposed to the activities of others. Um, States have also been clear at COPOS that this specific interpretation entails mandatory transfer of technology know-how from the states with the technology to those without, and also mandatory cooperation between developed countries and at least one developed country for every single activity in outer space of whichever kind. So it's a very rigid type of understanding of benefit sharing. And for this reason, really, uh, this position has been discontinued at COPOS. And I'm also going to park it for the rest of my, of my presentation. And the second understanding is today the most supported among states. Um, it, it basically has this assumption it builds on the, on the claim that every state has an equal right to access outer space and therefore to use it. <laughs> Um, and states can do that either on their own, so it could be single state activities or through cooperation, but there are no constraints about which type of cooperation. It could be between developed countries, between developing countries, whatever. This is an entirely discretionary type of assessment. But also states have been a particularly clear corpus in relation to the second understanding that uh, effectively this, this, uh, this understanding of benefit sharing entails that in using outer space, states have to share something back. They have to, do, to, to give something back in good faith, but also in proportion to their own capabilities. And this is very, very important. And that's why this understanding of the obligation is really an obligation of conduct or an obligation of due diligence. And then the, the third understanding of benefit sharing, uh, which is also the most recent one, it's emerging right now at COPOS, it basically builds on the claim that every state has a right to access the resources extracted from outer space by whichever country, even the resources extracted by other countries. Which means that from this perspective, the extracting country has an obligation, has a duty to share those resources with the international community as a whole, no matter what. Even if you are, for example, a private actor extracting resources from whichever celestial body, and even if you go bankrupt, you go past because you have to share something back, this is exactly what this, what this understanding requires. Effectively, reasoning along these lines transforms the obligation of benefit sharing into an obligation of result. You have to give back no matter what, even if you basically um, enter into troubles. As you can see, again, this, these three understandings are very different, these three understandings of benefit sharing, but they have a point of convergence. Uh, indeed, states, I must admit, they have been pretty clear and transparent at COPOS in saying that, um, in any case, states have a duty to use outer space equitably. So how do we use outer space equitably? I have explored options, options in, in relation to the two positions which are currently supported at COPOS. Um, so in relation to the idea of benefit sharing as an obligation of result, the one emerging in relation to space resources, really here the only way because of the structure of the obligation to, to, to use outer space equitably is to revert back to that logic of distributive justice which is also contained in a new convention on the law of the sea. Um, 
I think it's not going to work for the reasons that I have already explained, but also because when it comes to oil space, we don't even have the equivalent of the International Seabed Authority, okay, an international institution which has the mandate to share back on behalf of the international community of humanity, if you will. So this is a no-go to option for me. And in relation to the other, to the second understanding of benefit sharing, benefit sharing as an obligation of due diligence more than anything else, in the absence of some more concrete indication coming from the text of the treaty, but also state practice, here I have devised my own proportionality test. It's very experimental, a novel way of thinking about it. And this test is entirely grounded on general principles of international law. Now, general principles of international law, we know are formal sources of international law, which means that they can be immediately enforced by uh, national or international courts and tribunals, meaning that I am not reinventing the wheel, and specifically which principles I'm, I've looked at. I've looked at the principles governing the use of shared natural resources here on Earth, uh, with a focus on non-living resources, because non-living resources match the type of resources we have in outer space. And so in packaging together my proportionality test for benefit sharing, um, I have essentially applied the technique of extrapolation of relevant principles from relevant, relevant fields of international law, instead of drawing an analogy with the global commons, and in particular, the law of the sea. And so really my aim in trying to devise this proportionality test is to, is to determine first and foremost the quantum of benefit sharing, how much is appropriate to share on a case-by-case -case basis. Um, and also, I see this proportionality test as being um, open for application by states, but also private actors in relation to their own activities, including commercial activities. And so in brief, and I apologize for the brevity, but it requires some 35 pages of nitty gritty international law technicalities to provide the demonstration for this table that I have put in this slide. In short, my proportionality test really includes three governing principles and attending criteria. The first principle is reasonableness in sharing. Uh, so I, I believe you cannot just have an obligation to share if you then go bankrupt or something like that. So there should be some reasonableness behind it. The second principle is non-detrimental effects, first and foremost of the outer space activity performed, but also non-detrimental effects when it comes to the, uh, to the practical things that are shared with the international community. And third principle, and probably most important for the purposes of this, of this conference, is the idea of maximization of benefits. But maximization of benefits not for the state uh, operating in outer space, but for the recipient of the benefits. And here, really, I see an opportunity to always consider the role of international cooperation in benefit sharing, in a sense, as the best way of maximizing the benefits for the recipients. Uh, in particular, uh, I am of the view that we should consider sharing with international institutions, international organs, for example, uh, making financial or even non-financial means available to organs like the UN program on space applications would produce and can have long lasting impacts on several countries at the same time. And also, it would do that by essentially strengthening space capabilities of these states, which means this type of benefit sharing would grant autonomy in outer space for developing countries, and therefore it will lift them from the uh, dependency that we currently see, unfortunately. And so this is right the opposite of going for a one-off donation from one country to a single country. I, I really wrap up and conclude with, with the last slide. In developing my proportionality test, and so also in proposing an understanding of benefit sharing as an obligation of due diligence more than anything else, um, I really have in mind the opportunity to facilitate full compliance of any space activity, including commercial activities by space actors, with the provisions of the Outer Space Treaty of 1967, which is also what the Artemis Accords entail, if we think about it. Uh, but the thing is that the Artemis Accords, at the moment, they don't really elaborate on benefit sharing, 
they are not opposed to it. They are very much in favor of, for example, sharing uh, the data, scientific more than anything else, which will be produced by the, by the Artemis missions on the moon and elsewhere in perspective. But the thing is that they don't really elaborate on benefit sharing. And so here, in my view, there is an opportunity to really include at least some considerations about the role of international cooperation in benefit sharing. And this also uh, would allow us to, in a sense, free our mindset from drawing an analogy, a strict analogy with the uh, global commons, and in particular, the law of the sea, which builds on the premise that uh, the oceans and the, and the sea, but and so by analogy, outer space, should be treated as the uh, common heritage of mankind, meaning a global property, a common property of the international community as a whole. I, I guess I'm gonna stop here, thank you. Thank you, doctor. Any questions from the audience? Hi, Andrea Harrington, uh, Dean of Space Education at Air University. So I just want to ask your discussion about benefit sharing focused really on the sharing piece, right? How much sharing is appropriate in the circumstances with your balancing test? What I'm interested in is what your definition of a benefit is, whether that includes the data that you just mentioned that would be shared under the Artemis Accords, whether it's something more concrete like technology transfer or a monetary benefit from commercial exploitation or something like that. How can we define what the benefit is that, that we should be sharing if you think we should define that versus what the sharing itself means? Thanks. Yes, thank you very much for the question. Um, I'm not sure I have the right answer to the question, but I'll try my best. So in my view, uh, what you are supposed to share back, it really depends on the type of outer space activity that you are performing. If you are a satellite operator, obviously probably the focus would be on sharing some of the data or something like that. If you are extracting resources, data will be included in the package of going for the remote sensing of the celestial body you intend to uh, obviously exploit later on and so on and so forth. And then you will be extracting a sample and then you will go for the full scale commercial exploitation if obviously the sample extraction is positive. So as long as you have different stages, you could also flag up which one is the best way of sharing what within your activity. So it really depends in my view, sharing back on the type of activity we are talking about on outer space. What I am not really in favor as a matter of principle is to impose something to be shared like technology transfer and transfer of know-how, I think it should be just one of the many options in the hands of states, but also private actors. It should not be imposed because otherwise we would fall back into the first of the scenarios that I have suggested, the first of the understandings, which was very popular in the 1980s, especially within COPOS, the legal subcommittee. And because of this requirement of mandatory transfer of technology and know-how, but also mandatory cooperation with at least one developed country, whichever was the nature of the uh, space activity, it simply has been rejected by the international community. So I think that there is no point in going back that logic. But having said that, uh, probably it's also not feasible to provide a precise definition of benefit sharing. I see this as a very functional approach. And so depending on your activity and your own capabilities, then you have to share back, which means that sometimes the appropriate decision decision is that there is nothing to be shared in relation to a specific activity, especially I'm thinking of the startups going for space mining or those activities. Sometimes they are simply not in a position to share something back immediately with the international community. Personal opinion. Ma'am, we have a number of questions uh, that have come from our viewers uh, online. We do actually have a large number, uh, so maybe let's just take two for now and then um, get to Mr. Mermina's uh, presentation, and then we can take the rest maybe at the end. Um, so uh, I'm going to take these in kind of um, order maybe of relevance for some of the things that you talked about. Um, uh, Simona Tahelani, hopefully I pronounced your last name right. If I didn't, I'm sorry, uh, asks, what are some specific steps that private companies involved in space mining can take to minimize the environmental impact and ensure the safety of stakeholders involved in space travel and mining operations? I know that's maybe a little bit more technical, but it gets to some of the uh, the resource extraction uh, topics that you were speaking about, Mia. Yeah, 
well, I'm not sure which ones are the technical steps because I'm just a boring lawyer, so I'm not exactly familiar with the technology. <laughs> but probably what I would suggest is that if we're talking about benefit sharing, we should be focusing on the various steps, uh, which could be uh, leading to eventually the commercial exploitation of some of the resources. And so my understanding, and I apologize if it's not uh, entirely accurate, is that even for space mining, uh, this is a very complex activity. It's a very complex on its own. And so it starts with the observation, the remote sensing of the potential candidates, let's say, for exploitation. When you do remote sensing, you are generating data, obviously. And some of that data is, going, is also going to be sold, by the way. And so they are going to make money on that as well. And then they will be performing uh, um, the extraction of the sample. If the sample really suggests, OK, here there is some economic value, so go and, and perform the full exploitation, then it will end up extracting the resources. So I'm, I'm not sure uh, about the technicalities that the question was, was hinting to. But what I'm saying is that we probably should take a functional approach to the idea of sharing something back. And even a space mining company, I see that a form of benefit sharing appropriate benefit sharing will be sharing something back in terms of data generated as opposed to resources unless they are in a position and they are willing to do something like that. So it's really a functional approach that I am suggesting and that must be adapted on a case-by-case -case basis in relation to every single activity. Apologies for my, for my lack of the technology of the equipment. Well, may maybe one more question from online uh, for right now. Um, this question comes from Keith Abney, uh, who asks, on the right to access space resources, um, how does this entail the right to ownership? Would there, for instance, be this concept maybe of use without ownership, right? And how would that work? Um, he surmises that maybe like renewable resources could be an example. Um, and then finally, he asks, uh, so multi-part question, would non-state actors like private corporations, uh, many of whom right, we have here in the room today, um, also have these sorts of property rights to outer space resources? Yes, that is another very difficult question. And it's one of the hot topics currently discussed at COPOS. Now here I can only give my own view and understanding once again about property rights in outer space. I do believe that property rights do not exist in outer space, and my consideration comes from Article 2 of the Outer Space Treaty, uh, which clearly states the principle of non-appropriation of outer space. Um, so I don't see why uh, property rights should be generated out of the blue, in a sense, when it comes to extracting resources. Property rights are a manifestation of state sovereignty because property is a creation of individual rights. And so if there is no state sovereignty in outer space, there are also no property rights. I see no problem whatsoever in going for just the use of space resources as a very legitimate form of uh, you know, uh, recognition from the law. Um, also, if I was a space mining company, probably I would be selling the service of extracting those resources, whoever is going to use them at the end of the day. So I personally don't think that we need to have property rights, but I also recognize that there is another way of seeing this problem. And so many scholars and probably many private actors and some practitioners um, go for the analogy with the global commons. And so when you mine or when you use the resources of the area, the oceans and the sea, but in perspective, then yes, property rights are created on whatever you manage to extract. Um, if we go down this road, uh, you may have you know, gathered my distaste for the strict analogy with the global commons. So I'm not going to recommend this to anyone. Uh, you, can, you can easily do without property rights in outer space, even in relation to space mining. Um, well, thank you very much to yourself, Ryan, and PJ, and, and, and Rosa. Um, I, my, my name is Steve Marmina. I'm an attorney at NASA. I've been at NASA more than 23 years. And given that the panel is about international cooperation, that's essentially what I do for a living at NASA. Um, I've worked on more than a thousand international agreements for cooperation in outer space in my time at NASA. So this is something that I, I know a little bit about. Um, in 1958, when NASA was created, NASA's statute, the 1958 organic uh, statute that created NASA or the National Aeronautics and Space Act, 
um, gave NASA specific authority to run a program of international cooperation. Um, in fact, it's, it's one of the shall statements that NASA shall cooperate with other countries to share the benefits of outer space. And this was almost a decade before the Outer Space Treaty requirement. Um, in NASA's time of existence, uh, it's concluded more than 5,000 um, international agreements to share the benefits of outer space. And we have about 800 current international agreements. Um, what I thought I would do just to explain NASA's international agreement um, process uh, to, to you all. I know that you're all practicing attorneys, government attorneys mostly, in addition to private industry. So I, I'm going to break it down into the, the why, the how, and the who of international cooperation. So to start with why, why do countries cooperate in outer space? There are several reasons. The first is obviously cost. It's extremely expensive to go to outer space, and it's extremely difficult. By going together with other countries in outer space, we bring down costs and we benefit from mutual expertise. It's not accurate to think that the US houses all of the technical expertise in outer space. That wouldn't be true at all. So we work with other countries where we share expertise and together we jointly go and explore outer space. Besides cost and expertise, another really important reason to cooperate in space boils down to geography. For example, NASA has what we call the deep space network that we use to transmit voice and video around outer space or transmit signals back from Mars or tell where spacecraft are in the solar system. We have a station in California, we have a station in Spain, and we have a station in Australia. And by putting these three stations on three corners, if you will, around the globe, then we can have 360 degree coverage where we always have a ground satellite in touch with a satellite in outer space. So the ground receiving dishes are always able to receive the communications and we don't ever lose our satellites that are, that are in outer space. So for cost, expertise, and, and geography, that explains why we might want to cooperate in outer space. In addition to geopolitical concerns, um, NASA sometimes has been told by the White House, we would like you to conclude an agreement with such and such a country because we want to have closer international relations or foreign relations with that country. So with NASA being an instrument of the executive branch, we have been told by the executive that we want to have closer international cooperation. And in that regard, NASA will work with the State Department to um, review any foreign policy concerns with our international cooperation. In terms of the how we do international cooperation, we do generally international agreements and by international agreements, I mean agreements that are legally binding under international law. That's atypical, right? Most of the agreements we do are probably uh, in the sense of contracts under US federal law. But NASA's agreements under international law, think of it this way, space agencies of different countries, when they conclude agreements, those agreements should be governed by international law. It wouldn't be fair to impose US law on a foreign entity, and it wouldn't be fair for NASA to be subject to, to a foreign entity's law. And I'm just gonna look around the room. Has anybody heard of the C-175 process? One in the back, two, three, four, okay, good. The C-175 process is an interagency process where NASA works with this, the State Department and we will have the State Department review a draft agreement. They look for any concerns that they have legally or for foreign policy. And then they send it around to other US government agencies to review. And assuming that they don't have any objections, then we can proceed with signature of the agreement. One of the leading ways that NASA concludes its international agreements is through what we call framework agreements. A framework agreement is essentially an umbrella agreement that we conclude with another country that has all of the legally binding clauses that we need to effectuate 
the cooperation. Once we have the umbrella agreement in place, the lawyer's work is done. At that point, we do what we call implementing arrangements where we just merely implement the umbrella agreement. It's similar in some ways to a status of forces agreement. The framework agreements contain all the clauses that we need to be legally binding to do our international cooperation. They usually start with a purpose clause, some responsibilities, and then they have the clause that the lawyers care about, the cross waiver of liability clause, intellectual property clauses, transfer of goods and technical data or export control provisions. And then at the end, they have what we call final clauses, which is instructions on if you want to amend or terminate the agreement or, um, you know, kind of the, the technical international agreement clauses come to follow. So we have widespread cooperation with almost all countries around the world, except for those countries with whom we don't cooperate. And two countries stand out. Um, Russia is, is certainly one where we have a special exemption right now for cooperation related to the ISS, the International Space Station. And the second country with whom we don't cooperate bilaterally is China. And um, back in 2011, there was a congressman named Congressman Wolf from Virginia who was extremely upset about human rights practices in China in addition to China's theft of intellectual property from the US and national security concerns. And in NASA's Appropriations Act that year, there was a specific prohibition against NASA cooperating with the Chinese government. And that prohibition in our appropriation has been renewed every year since 2011. So we cannot spend any appropriated dollars on Co on bilateral cooperation with China. Um, one word, if I may, about the, the, the Artemis Accords. There's been a lot of discussion about the Artemis Accords and who they apply to and who they don't apply to. And, and this is true, I think, also for the Outer Space Treaty and other treaties. The Artemis Accords is signed by states, not by private parties. But there is a provision in there, I think it's in section two, that says that um, countries around the world will slow down the uh, commitments of the Artemis Accords to their private industry. And the way they do that is through contracts. So for example, if we, the US, wanted, let's say, SpaceX or Blue Origin or, or Lockheed or whoever the private company might be to abide by the principles of the Artemis Accords. Well, the US government had made that commitment to the other Artemis Accords signatories. And if we want our private industry to abide by that, then the way we do that is by having a contract with private industry where we put a term in the contract where we make something that's not legally binding, legally binding, by means of making a contractual obligation. And PJ had raised a point um, earlier in his remarks about the Artemis Accords being um, essentially creating a, a standard of care of responsible behavior in outer space. And looking forward, I think that is something that we're going to see coming down the road where if there ever is a question of fault liability in outer space, I think, and if a tribunal ever were established under the liability convention or you know, and by the ICJ or some other arbiter, they may ask whether or not a particular entity complied with the Artemis Accords and therefore more or less acted as a responsible person and whether or not that might be relevant in a determination of fault. I think that is something that we might see coming down the road. So that about summarizes my remarks, but I'm happy to take any questions. Well, we find questions there. I'll ask a question. Um, you talked about the interagency process. What's the process like um, nation to nation? Like how long does an international agreement usually take to finalize? So that, that, that's a great question. Um, I'm, I'm smiling because um, just a couple of months ago, we signed an agreement with the um, government of Japan, one of these framework agreements, that no joke 
I've been working on for more than 15 years. And we'd work and we'd get really close to signature and then for one reason or another, it would get sidetracked or, or derailed. Um, and most recently we worked on it really, really diligently. And it took probably about a year and a half from the time everybody had recommitted to do it, to getting it done. And there are a couple of reasons for that. Um, of course, there's the negotiations, which takes a lot of time, but it's not a question of language. Um, in fact, we're doing one of these framework agreements right now with the government of Australia. So we speak the same language, but it doesn't mean that we instantly conclude the, the agreement. Um, and it also depends, oh, so, so on language, one of the steps that's taken before uh, finalization and signature is what we call language conformance, where we generally negotiate the whole agreement in English, and then in this example, it's translated into Japanese. And then the Japanese translation is checked by translators, it, by contractors for the, for the US State Department. And then we'll check it word by word to make sure that the Japanese word matches the English word. And there are sometimes nuances that are very, very slight, like liability and responsibility certainly are, are, are words like that. Um, but there could be some strange intellectual property terms that are different here in the US than, than in other countries. So that's one reason. The second reason it sometimes takes so long is because the foreign entities parliamentary process for ratification could take one and a half or two years by the time they get it into their system and it's reviewed by various committees and then it's approved on by the foreign entities parliament. Um, so frequently what we'll have in our international agreements is a clause um, that says essentially that we will um, agree to the terms of what we call this ad ref agreement, even before the agreement goes into force. It's called provisional application. So we will act as if the agreement's in force even before it's in force. And that's one way we can get from the time we initial the agreement to the time that it goes into force, which could be, like I said, up to two years. It's a great question, thanks. Thank you. It's probably an unfair question, but I'm gonna ask it anyway. Um, you mentioned obviously that you're not able to uh, enter into an agreement with China um, and Russia. How sensible do you think that is in the current context, and particularly in relation to space, in terms of keeping them outside of the tent, as opposed to trying to bring them in? So I suppose I should have started with the standard disclaimer that these are my thoughts and don't represent necessarily the views of NASA or the US government. So um, let, let's treat the two countries differently because they're very different, right? So with Russia, there are clear and compelling reasons why the world community wants to ostracize them right now. They, they are taking an action which is illegal under international law. And we can have a whole discussion about whether international law is the extent to which it's enforceable, right? Whether it be UN sanctions or the Security Council and whether or not international law is even effective. But one way international law is effective is by telling a country, you're not behaving properly, we're not going to do business with you. So it makes a lot of sense from a geopolitical standpoint for us to not be doing things with Russia at the moment. Setting that aside, there are operational considerations at NASA that we have this very large space station that we spent about $100 billion on it's the size of a football field long by a football field wide, where we and the Russians essentially were kind of married in, in outer space, right? We have systems that are interdependent on each other. We rely on them for astronaut transportation, um, for uh, resupply, whether it be food or, or clothing or the propulsion system to reboost the ISS. So there could be some very, very compelling reasons why we don't want to do more with them, but we're, we're so connected to them in, in outer space cooperation that there are programs that we need to um, continue cooperating for programmatic reasons. I also want to remind everyone about in the 1970s, I think it was 1972, during the, the, the maybe even the peak of the Cold War, is when we had the Apollo Soyuz mission in outer space and uh, cosmonauts and um, US astronauts, they, they met in space and they opened the hatch and they shook hands. And the thought at the time was, we don't wanna take terrestrial conflict and carry it into outer space. 
And there's something about NASA and um, pursuing education and science and sharing the benefits with the world that there's a lot of merit, I think, into keeping terrestrial conflicts terrestrial and not bringing them with us into outer space. So that's Russia. In, in terms of China, and again, this is this is just Steve's view now, not, not the NASA view. Th there are not that many other countries around the world that can launch a space station and launch astronauts and bring them back or go to the far side of the moon and put a rover down. And they, they've done so many things technologically. It's curious that the US is not cooperating with them. I think that there are some compelling reasons, particularly regarding um, IP and tech transfer and national security. And it's in the newspapers that, that China is one of the, the primary sources of cyber attacks on, on US computer systems. It's not secret information. Um, so there are compelling reasons why we're not cooperating, but it's unfortunate that we can't work together given the two countries technical skills that we can't use them together, that right now we're in this competitive rather than this cooperative environment. Hi. Uh, oh, thank you, David Burbach from the Naval War College. Actually, a, a follow on to that. With the Artemis program, we are uh, headed towards landing astronauts near the South Pole of the Moon. And that's exactly the same area that is of interest to China. So a question is at the moment, um, specifically with respect to the moon and the possibility, you know, while the moon is very large, the areas of interest at the South Pole are actually close enough that we may need to worry about, you know, plume interference or, you know, they want to study the same patch of ice that we do. If we don't get past the current status quo, what do you see as potential problems ahead with kind of going to the same part of the moon? Thanks. That's a fantastic question. And, um, and we can chat more about that. But a lot of people say, hey, the moon is really huge, right? It's maybe uh, similar in size to the Pacific Ocean. But you're right. There are only certain areas of it that we want to visit. And it's not just China and the US. It's also the UAE wants to be there, India, Japan, the Europeans. Um, so it's going to get really congested. Um, the Artemis Accords have some provisions which are relevant to that. Um, interoperability is one. It would be fantastic if we could have systems work together where you'd have some duplication in case our comm systems went down. If we could use theirs or somebody else's, that would be a wonderful way to, to, to work together. And deconfliction of space activities is going to be key. And in terms of deconfliction, I think the key to deconfliction is to have transparency. Right, we're with an announcement like we are going to this place, we're going to conduct this activity, we're going to be finished conducting with this activity on such and such a date, and then we're going to, you know, pack up our wagons and go. It, it's the lack of transparency, I think, which could cause conflict. It's the lack of transparency which is going to create distrust and 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 potential conflict resulting from that. So, I think where the US will announce where we're going and what we're gonna do, China has not been as transparent in its space plans. And um, I think if they were to be more transparent, it would do a lot to reduce conflict, um, not, not just on the lunar South Pole, but elsewhere. Great question, thank you. So uh, I see that we have slightly less than 10 minutes. So this is a question that we could open up to everybody. Uh, and Mr. Mermina, if you want to start, um, or you guys can decide uh, who's maybe best to answer it. Aaron Johnson asks, how do multinational space enterprises, especially public and private enterprises, successfully balance innovation and synergy against national tech transfer and export control regimes? Uh, and these kind of corporate and government espionage regimes um, that are supposed to prevent, right, these sorts of technology transfers. So I can go first with that. Um, th this is not a new issue, right? This is something we've been dealing with for, for decades, but we have very large corporations and we have very compelling reasons why we have export control laws. Right, And we at NASA, we work with these large corporations and we 
have we we bump into export control daily, right? It, it, it's a very serious issue where we will work with a U.S. subsidiary of sometimes a foreign company, and we'll give them access to information, but under certain conditions that they, they cannot take that know-how and retransfer it to foreign persons, or they will be um, in, in violation of the export control laws. So when we work with U.S. entities, um, there are, of course, really strict um, regulations that are on the U.S. entity to, to not um, violate export control. When we work with foreign entities, the international, I'm looking around the room, see, does anybody do export control law? If I did said section 126.4, does that ring a bell with anybody? Um, there are certain exemptions under the export control laws where uh, if you have an international agreement that requires a transfer of hardware, that would essentially function in some ways like a TAA or technical assistance agreement, which you'd get through the State Department or through DDTC um, that would authorize a specific transfer to a specific person. And then at the end of the cooperation, they either have to give it back or they have to destroy the, the hardware. Um, but it's something that it, 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 it's been a concern and it will continue to be a concern. But it's not just in the US. I mean, countries that are members of the MTCR, all the European countries, they have to abide by that as well. So most of our foreign partners are, are well aware of it and, and they understand the reasons for it. And, and the reasons are we, we don't want to be giving technology to say Iran, which has said it wants to blow Israel off the face of the map, right? We, we don't wanna be giving them the technology that would enable them to, 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 to do such things, right? Anyway, Rosa, PJ? I just wanted to say that international law on this point remains pretty much neutral. So it becomes really an assessment on part of states. And if there is any bilateral agreement as you were mentioning, probably that is the, the way to go. Otherwise, public international law as such as not general principles should apply to this type of question. I would maybe jump in and, and say that if you're thinking about this from an in-house perspective from these companies, right, this is, it's just a hardcore compliance issue. Um, you've got to have your ducks in a row and you've got to, um, you've got to be able to recognize when these export control issues are coming into play and make sure that, that you have the proper um, dividers up within your company. Um, and, and as far as balancing that with innovation, I think that within the realm of space, this is, um, it's a fact of life. It's one of those things that you have to deal with is that export control is going to impact you. And, and in particular, ITAR is going to impact you. Um, and so it's about having robust processes within your corporation to deal with these issues, to make sure that you strike that balance. And that balance is going to probably be different for every corporation in in the in the area or in the space that's that's doing this um and it's just it's you know it's a fact of life you have to deal with it okay thank you very much to uh, major sample and our entire panel um and in the spirit of international cooperation i would love to provide you with one of our coveted conference coins <laughs> 